Good morning to you and both of you. I'm glad to see a couple of people in the room. I don't mind lecturing to an empty room and it will be recorded for the benefit of others later, but it's always nice to see some people uh, in the room. And I'm glad that you are both able uh, to join today. Maybe some others will come on board, uh, even though it's a major holiday today. Uh, good morning, Tafsir, uh, Tafsir, and also good morning to Ahmed, who's called in because I couldn't uh, persuade Blackboard to give me a link, um, a video link. But in any case, uh, you're welcome to join in and jump in. I'm going to cover today a really very important topic. And uh, yeah, happy Thanksgiving to you too. Um, I'm covering something today which is extremely important. Um, because it's a follow-up to the prisoner's dilemma, and uh, it's going to pertain in many ways to our life today uh, as human beings on this planet, both in microcosmic and also in macrocosmic context, which I'll be enumerating as we go forward. So I'm going to assume, for the purposes of today's lecture, <clears throat> that you have sufficiently digested uh, the basic dilemma as it pertained to two people in the allegorical form that was presented last day, namely that of two prisoners being taken into custody and then separated and each one told that the others informed uh, on him or her, as you understood from the original um, allegory, and then having to make a choice uh, whether to cooperate, namely to remain silent and not give evidence against uh, the fellow prisoner, or indeed to uh, defect, which is to say to give evidence. Um, and you saw the payoffs that ensued. I'm going to load the slideshow up again in a morning, in a moment, um, and share that with you. Um, so I'm going to just bear with me while I uh, share that screen with you. Application screen. Here we go. Apparently, it's cooperating this morning. Uh, so at least some of you see the screen. Those of you who haven't dialed in can see the screen. Am I correct? Yes? Okay, very well. Thank you. Thank you, Tafsir. Okay, so uh, you understand what makes the dilemma a dilemma, uh, that there are really two conflicting principles of choice. This is the so-called deeper structure of the problem, and we looked at those last day. Uh, we saw, I think, very clearly that the dominance principle tells you you're better off defecting no matter what the other prisoner chooses. And uh, that, that's, uh, I think, very intuitively a clear principle. Many of us uh, probably utilize dominance thinking in certain cases, and, you know, I think, again, at a, at a fairly instinctive level. And then the more sophisticated argument, which nonetheless is p potentially a more general argument, if Hobbes is right about our nature, that we're all sort of utility maximizers, uh, maximizing expected utility, although it can be done as a formal computation, uh, would just tell us to choose the uh, most likely um, preferable outcome for ourselves. And in the prisoner's dilemma, on the assumption that both players are going to play alike, <clears throat> that assumption, by the way, being both theoretically and empirically supported, there's a lot of support. Um, in experiments, in iterated cases, that both players will lock into either the Nash equilibrium or the Pareto optimal outcome. There's very strong evidence for that. So on that assumption, uh, maximizing expected utilities would prescribe cooperation. So then it's not so much a choice. Oh, and the other, the other very important point is that you don't even need certainty or you don't even need a degree of near certainty uh, that the other player will play as you do. You only need mathematically to believe that the other player will cooperate with probability greater than one half. <clears throat> and if you have reason to believe that, then in fact the calculus also prescribes that you cooperate. So if you think there's a greater than 50-50 chance that the other prisoner cooperates, then you should cooperate too. Uh, because that will lead you both to the Pareto optimal outcome. So in any case, you, you see and we saw that this is really a question now of not whether simply to choose to cooperate or defect, 
but deep, more deeply than that, to select a principle such that the principle itself is going to generate, through its own internal logic, is going to generate the choice that you ultimately make. And if we iterate the game from a one-shot case to a, um, an iterated case, in other words, play many, many rounds of the game, then that principle, uh, when it becomes iterated, is called a strategy. Uh, so I think that's fairly clear. And then we looked uh, initially at some large-scale applications of the two-prisoner case or the two-person case, such as the Cold War arms race, which is patently modelable, modelable as a prisoner's dilemma. We, I, I mentioned some something fairly new from the 1980s. That's evolutionary game theory where two animals, we're not talking literally about doves and hawks, but animals competing over a resource, members of the same species, uh, competing over a resource can either play the so-called dove strategy and decide to share it, in which case they, they get the payoff, uh, or they can uh, ad adopt the hawk strategy and decide to try to monopolize it, in which case they'll come into conflict. So even though one succeeds in monopolizing it, perhaps after a struggle, they'll both incur injuries potentially, which threaten their inclusive fitness, or they may or they may simply... Uh, somehow decide that uh, one is going to dominate it and the other one may just uh, retreat from the field. And so that that one will get the suckers pay off, but of course no uh, benefit of the resource at all. Um, so it is also multiple. Many conflicts in nature between uh, members of the same species uh, are modelable also on this uh, theory. Okay. So are there any questions before we move on now to the, I think, more complicated and and really more interesting case, which is the end person case where we have not simply two players, but potentially many players in the game. Uh, do you have any questions uh, about the about the two player case? Or are you clear on what we covered last day? Can you hear me? Uh, you have to speak up a bit, uh, Ahmed, as I'm still not hearing you well. I'm, I'm sorry, can you hear me right now? A little bit better, yeah. All right, yeah, I just have a question about when it's many rounds of a game, it's called a strategy, right? A principle is in the one shot. It's just a terminology. If you're making a decision, I mean, not everybody would even use a principle. Some people want to flip a coin, right? You can't, you can't know whether people will be rational or, or how they're going to express it. So what we just say is, to answer you straightforwardly, if it's a one-shot case, uh, then we call it a principle of decision. If it's an iterated case where you have to uh, apply that principle over and over again, and perhaps in light of experience change the principle, then we call it a strategy. All right. Thank you. Okay? Yeah. Okay. And that's a little bit like a distinction between strategies and tactics. Uh, not quite, but in any case, I don't want to complicate this unnecessarily. So a principle is is the choice that guides you uh, or the, the rather the reason for the choice you make in a one-shot case, a strategy would be a more comprehensive plan that would guide you in uh, an iterated case. All right? Fair enough. Anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, fine. So let's go on to the, I think, more rich and more interesting and also a little more scary scenario uh, that we're going to look at now and it doesn't begin in a scary way but it will take us to some uh, perhaps uh, scary places today uh, not, not scary as in the sense of a horror story but scary in the sense of what happens when a very large number of people playing in a prisoner's dilemma uh, not necessarily by their own choice but by the nature of things when they decide to defect uh, sometimes bad things happen so uh, let me just begin with an allegory Again, just as we started with the allegory of the two prisoners taken into custody, that illustrates the fundamental features of the model in the generic case. Now we're going to look at a, a different allegory that would illustrate some of the fundamental features of the model in the end player case. This is a sort of an amusing case. Please don't take it literally. It's, again, just an allegory or, or if you prefer, a kind of metaphor. But imagine, we call it the diner's dilemma. So imagine for a moment that you're going out to lunch with nine friends. So there's 10 of you going out to lunch. And imagine that you all agree beforehand to split the check. 
And in fact, that is what happens typically when we used to have restaurants. Remember back before COVID, when maybe you did go out to lunch with a bunch of friends and those days may return soon, I hope. But imagine or remember when you went to a restaurant, any party typically over six people, the restaurant would not issue individual checks anyway. They would just give one check to the group. Does that ring a bell with anyone? Any of you remember this? Not immediately. Okay, well, you can take my word for it <laughs> that generally large parties are given, yeah, they're given one check and they split the check. So you agree to split the check with your nine friends. And then let's suppose, for the sake of argument, there are two choices in this restaurant. You can have salad or you can have steak. And the uh, we'll suppose that the salad costs $10 and the steak costs $20, just for the sake of argument, to simplify it, all right? So you don't know what the other people are going to order because the server is coming around or maybe more than one server is taking your orders at the same time. So basically you have salad for $10 or steak for 20 Now suppose that um, you are going to order salad and everybody else orders steak. Of course, for in a simple case, everybody orders salad. So if there's 10 of you ordering salad, the check is $100, you each pay 10 all right. Suppose everybody orders steak, then the check is two hundred dollars and it's twenty dollars each. So that's all uh, in the uniform cases. But suppose now that not everyone orders the same. So for the for the sake of argument, suppose you alone order salad and everybody else orders steak. So you got nine times twenty. If you look at the check, it's going to be one hundred ninety dollars, right? It'll be nine steaks. At twenty dollars each is one hundred and eighty dollars plus your salad, one hundred and ninety dollars. But you've already agreed to split the check evenly. So you, as the only salad eater in the group, are now going to pay nineteen dollars for a ten dollars salad, correct? And that's equivalent to the sucker's payoff. And everybody else is paying uh, actually nineteen dollars for a twenty dollars steak. So everybody else did marginally better, just a little probably not very significant savings, but you really got nailed because you're, you're paying almost double for your salad and you're not enjoying the benefit of the steak. Okay, is that clear? So uh, that, that's one situation. Now, the other very asymmetric situation would be where, uh, in fact, uh, most people um, order salad and only one person orders steak and again if you're that person if most people order salad it's nine times let's say nine times uh, ten dollars ninety dollars for nine salads and you you order steak at 20 so the check is 110 dollars correct and you're again you're splitting it evenly so now you're the only one who had steak and you're only paying eleven dollars for a twenty dollar steak which is a really great uh, deal for you yes you paying you know, you got something that costs 20 and you're only paying 11. That's because you kind of took advantage in a way of everybody else ordering salad. And they didn't pay that much more. They all paid $11 for the $10 salads, but you got a really good deal. So you could see that in a darner's dilemma, it's showing you that there can be disparities and that people who, um, who don't do what everybody else does can sometimes be punished in a certain sense by the actions of the others. Um, or indeed could be rewarded in a certain sense by the actions of the others, depending on how the asymmetries line up. Is that fair enough? You understand that? You're clear? Okay, thank you, Tapsir. So you see that it becomes more complicated, and we're not going to now start calculating all possibilities, but we could do averages and statistically likely outcomes and so forth, which is what economists do. Uh, economists would do this, and so would uh, sociologists and other people studying large groups. Uh, they would do that um, in order to to try to estimate all the many kinds of uh, differing outcomes that will result from differing proportions of choice in the model. So that's a, just an overview in an allegorical way of what the Donner's dilemma looks like. Again, it's an n-person dilemma. Um, still, it's a prisoner's dilemma but has many more possible outcomes. Now we're going to get to a really significant model. This is not an allegory anymore. This is an actual model. And this is the one I want to focus on today for the most part. It's uh, published originally in the 1970s by Garrett Hardin, uh, and it became a kind of iconic article uh, published in Science, uh, the leading American journal 
which everyone wants to publish in. Uh, it covers a whole range of sciences, but it publishes not always highly technical or not usually highly technical uh, problems. It publishes problems in sciences that are accessible to other sciences so that the readership can generally understand the significance of the publication. It's the most desirable publication, I think, if you want to attain fame and fortune. Certainly, uh, it's the American equivalent of the publication called Nature, which is the British one. And those are the two uh, generically leading publications, not specialty publications in a given field of science, but again, generic publications um, in which the findings from a whole range of sciences are highlighted. And they have the highest, needless to say, the highest rejection rates because the, everybody wants to publish in science or nature. Garrett Hardin's landmark paper in science called The Tragedy of the Commons uh, is uploaded in your Google Drive folder. So if you're interested in this topic, and I'm going to show you soon how many possible applications it has to our contemporary situations, uh, then, of course, you're more than welcome to read his original. But I'm going to summarize his original for you. He doesn't set it up this way. Of course, it's an in-person prisoner's dilemma in which most people defect. But the generic problem is expressed as follows. If you're in a situation with a large number of other people, or simply, simply a number of other people, where there are natural resources at stake, there's always going to be some, some temptation on your part basically for profit, for your own benefit in one way or another, to overexploit the resources. You're going to always be tempted to overexploit the resources. And if nobody overexploits the resources, this is Pareto optimal, because then presumably you all survive well enough, but the resources, the natural resources themselves are not being <clears throat> overexploited or harmed past the point of uh, recuperation or, or um, regeneration or renewability. Um, but if, on the other hand, everybody is tempted uh, to overexploit the resources, uh, then eventually the tragedy is that the resource itself may collapse. It may simply disappear. It may be overexploited to the vanishing point. It may not be renewable or recoverable, and then naturally everybody suffers. So what you probably want as a rugged individualist uh, would be just for you <laughs> to be <laughs> to be able to exploit or over exploit the resource with long you know everybody else while well, everybody else cooperates uh, that way you can help yourself to exploitation but of course if other people think as you do uh, then everyone's going to be tempted and then we'll end up as usual in the Nash equilibrium and what Hardin argues is that actually this leads to ruin for all when everybody chooses to defect in the model, as it were, by overexploiting the resource. It's a shared resource understood to be not your resource, but a common resource. Yes, something that is shared by all people, either in law or simply because it's unregulated. So it's a common resource. Uh, and when everybody chooses to overexploit it, this leads inevitably to the ruin of the commons itself. That's Hardin's thesis. And maybe not everyone agrees that it's inevitable, that is inevitably so. But unfortunately, we're all besieged by examples showing that it's very difficult to avoid it being inevitably so. So let me firstly share with you the, um, the actual scenario that Hardin himself portrays in the original paper. So I'm going to put up, uh, in this case, the whiteboard. And I'll just explain the original model that Hardin is, is calling upon is an agricultural model from an older time in Britain, uh, which still may apply. I'm going to try and draw on the whiteboard today. This is a bit challenging, but um, uh, I know one of you can't see this, but you can watch the recording later, Ahmed, and you can also hear me, presumably. So just imagine now, for the, for the sake of argument, that there's a big common land here that I'm highlighting in the, this, this thing doesn't let me move anything, does it? Once I draw it, I'm kind of done. Um, so let me then erase this and try and redraw it in the middle of the screen. Um, so you can see it properly. Uh, it's a little bit better. Okay, so imagine this blue oval is a common 
it's a common land. Basically, I'm going to say common land. So in other words, anybody can use it. Common land means commons, yes? And anybody can use it. Now, suppose that surrounding this commons, and now I'm going to change the color. Um, suppose there are a number of, 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 um, of farmers uh, who have cattle. And, and what they're doing is they're basically interested in grazing cattle. And each one of them uh, has their own land. And they can graze cattle on their own land, right? Imagine I'm drawing all these little circles now on the border of the commons. Some are little, some are bigger. Each farm doesn't necessarily have the same number of cattle. But each one of these farmers is going to reason as follows. Imagine you're one of these farmers and you have a piece of land and your land is adjoining the commons. So just imagine uh, you're going to say to yourself, well, you know, the, my profit as a farmer uh, depends on the number of cattle I can graze. I mean, if that's the business you're in, then the more cattle you graze, the more whatever, whether they're milk or dairy, this same point goes through. If they're dairy cattle, then the more cattle you have and can graze, then the more milk you produce and sell, so more profitable. And also, uh, if you're, or alternatively, if you're ra raising beef, then the more cattle you can graze, the more beef you're going to sell to the market, so the more profitable your business is. So either way, it's in your individual interest, is it not, to add as many cattle as you can to your herd. Is everybody with me on this? Is that rational? Yes? <clears throat> you all with me? You see that this is a rational perspective? Yes, okay, you see this is a rational point for each farmer to take into account. So what do you do? If you're an individual farmer um, and your land is limited, but the commons is much bigger, you're going to say to yourself at some point, you know what, if I add extra cattle to my herd, at some point I will exceed what's called the carrying capacity of my own land. In other words, my own land will not be big enough to sustain all these cattle, but I can graze them on the commons because no one's using the commons. And therefore, I can take advantage of it. I can, in other words, exploit the common land and add more cattle to my herd and graze them there and therefore be more profitable. And surely that's a reasonable argument to make. Well, what Hardin's point is, and I'm sure by now you see it coming, is that what if all farmers say this? What if, all, what if every farmer around the whole common says, you know what, I'm going to add more cattle to my herd and graze them on the commons? What's going to happen at some point to the commons? If that process increases in an unlimited way, what's going to happen to the commons? Anybody? Uh, can, can you hear me, Professor? The land is going to be barren. I can hear you. What's going to happen to the commons? The land is going to be barren. It's going to be desert eventually. Cause there's going to yes, be so it's going to be overgrazed, isn't it? Exactly right. It's going to be basically it'll be ruined because it's just going to be overgrazed. Everyone's going to want to exploit it, but no one's assuming any responsibility for replanting or doing anything to take care of the land because they see it just as a resource to exploit, do they not? They're going to take care of their own land, but going to exploit the commons eventually if it's unregulated. It will be overexploited. There will be so many cattle, in fact, that they can't control any longer uh, the regrowth, let's say, of pasture. And the commons will, as you say, perhaps turn into a desert or at least become barren or overgrazed and will no longer be useful. But then what happens to the farmers? Then they can't feed their own cattle anymore. And so they are going to collapse as well. Their profits will collapse because they will no longer be able to sustain the, the herds that they've expanded in order to exploit the commons, you see? So the feedback to them is they eventually lose too, right? And that's called the tragedy. This is what the point of Garrett Hardin's paper is. It's called the tragedy of the commons because it results in a tragedy. It may be good for a while, and if you plot this on a curve, some kind of economic profitability curve, you'll discover that everyone's going to make money for a while. And if you're sitting there not adding cattle, watching all your neighbors add cattle to their herds and, and become more profitable every year, you might start kicking yourself and saying, gee, I should be doing this too. It's going to be hard for you to resist. 
because you're in competition with them, partly. But at some point, the commons will collapse. And so Hardin's conclusion is that freedom, if you allow this to be absolutely unrestricted, you just give people the liberty to do whatever they want with a common resource. Uh, Hardin's conclusion is that freedom in a commons of this kind, if it's total freedom, it will, will actually ruin everybody involved. It will bring ruin to all. That's his thesis. And so it would therefore imply that we need to exercise some kind of restraint. We need liberty limiting principles. We're back to Thomas Hobbes, aren't we? We're back to the need for some kind of a social contract where we're, we're going to agree to restrict our own liberties in terms of the actually the, the betterment of everybody. So in any case, uh, do you understand Hardin's point that freedom in a commons will actually be ruined, will, will bring ruin to, to everyone concerned? <clears throat> this is clear, I hope. And that's why it's called the, uh, uh, okay, thank you uh, for the feedback. And that's why it's called the tragedy. It is, a, it is tragic and it need not have, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to happen, uh, but it is a tragedy because it happens over and over again. So that's the general thesis. And uh, I'll stop sharing the whiteboard if I can. Um, where do I uh, <clears throat> stop? Oh, this is the thing, okay. So uh, I've stopped sharing the whiteboard. I'm gonna pull up the slides again so that you can see how this is modeled and we, we just we just looked at it it's modeled I mean, you already know how it's modeled it's an n person prisoner's dilemma where indeed most people most players uh, decide to uh, defect in this case defection means over exploit the resource so that's where it goes to now let me give you some illustrations this is the generic model right uh, we're not specifying what the resource is. We're merely supposing there are a large number of players, and there's you on one, on the one hand, because each of us in the model is an, an, an individual decision maker. Certainly, you are always going to be regarded as an individual in the model, but the other uh, player is not just one other prisoner in a prison style. It's many others. It's and others. Could be a very large number of others. Could be a whole society of people, and they're all playing the same game in this case. We're all looking at the opportunity of either overexploiting a common resource or not. And so it becomes an end person prison dilemma. And if we all defect, or if a majority of people defect, then uh, that will result in drastic overexploitation. And Hardin says if you push it far enough, it goes to collapse. And then we're in this Nash equilibrium. But then at some point, you can't even get out of it because there's nothing left. <laughs> there isn't going to be anything left to stop exploiting. In some cases, this process may be irreversible. So I don't, I'm not trying to depress you this morning, but I, I want you to be aware that not all of these resources will recover if left to their own devices. So now the time comes when we will pull up uh, a list of examples, and I'm going to give you quite a few uh, and see if, if you can... Uh, think of some, or perhaps I'll start with you this morning. I know there are only a few of you in the room, so I took the liberty of preparing a list to share with you because I know that normally uh, people would be able to suggest examples given a large enough group in the in the room. But uh, do any of you have any intuitions about what might constitute a contemporary real-world example of a tragedy of the commons? Does anything spring to mind? If so, uh, feel free to state it or, or, or enter it. Can I answer? Yes, please, Ahmed. Uh, the exploitation of the environment, perhaps. Like you have deforestation. Uh, trees can be used to make paper, and paper can be converted into making money. And thus, if all the farmers in a small town think that way, then they will all exploit their trees. And that's what happens in many farming communities. A lot of farmers tear down their trees to sell for lumber or to make paper. And a lot of these communities will end up eventually destroyed because there's not enough trees to go around for everyone. Yeah, the forestry issue is uh, definitely there. And it's, of course, much more nuanced because with trees, we're, we're dealing with a more complicated situation. Your example will hold water up to a point. Let me just say I have some familiarity with this myself. Uh, paper uh, mills generally use softwood, 
not hardwood. Uh, so you want to plant fir trees. Um, they're the best things for making paper. They're the easiest things to mulch and to turn into paper. The hardwoods are good for fireplaces and for furniture and for other kinds of projects. And so, indeed, both hardwoods and softwoods can be used for construction. Um, but basically, the uh, deforestation has been a problem and not just for paper. Uh, if you're looking at deforestation, uh, that in itself is a huge problem. Um, but it's uh, not necessarily exactly a tragedy of the commons. It's a, it's a different kind of problem, but it's certainly a related one. Uh, one of you just talked about dumping waste into the water. Yes, yeah, Stuart, that is unfortunately a very widespread example, and I'm going to elaborate that one because you've just labeled, Stuart just said, and I, I think you can read in the chat room, dumping waste into the water. Now, we could we can look at a long and sad history of polluting not only freshwater sources like rivers, uh, but also the oceans it's themselves are now polluted in many ways, right? So that's definitely tragedy to the commons. Let's start with rivers. There's a very famous case, which is, it may sound almost amusing, and in some respects it's very tragic comic, but in New Jersey, there's a river called the Raritan, I'm typing that in so you can look it up if you want to. The Raritan River. And in the U.S., uh, during the days before any environmental controls, the Raritan River had a lot of industrial plants on it, and a lot of a lot of chemical and paint plants. And they used to dump their waste into the river, and, you know, the river just flows out to the sea. Nobody cared. It's a commons. The river's a commons, and everyone was using it for dumping, as Stewart asserts in his generic example. So what happened in the Raritan River, one of the things that happened was as follows. Not only did it get polluted with chemicals, but there was a paint company upstream, and it, it was well known that on the weekends – that people used to camp and picnic on the riverbanks. You know, citizens of New Jersey would go, maybe others would, would go and camp or picnic in overlooking the rivers, very scenic, in parts where it wasn't built up. That would have been downstream of the industrialization. So they used to enjoy picnicking or camping on the river. And the paint plant, one of the big polluters was a paint plant. And on Fridays, very deliberately, they used to make sure to dump only green and blue paint and paint waste products of a green and blue color into the river so people would think it was water. So, so if you're camping on the river, you're looking at the river, you know, rivers change color with depending on ambient conditions and the, you know, the sky and whatnot. So people would see this green or blue water, blue green water flowing by, they would assume it was a river. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases it was paint. And one day the river caught fire. This is a true story. So the, all of a sudden you're looking at this river and it's on fire and you realize this is not water. It may have looked like water, but it was actually paint. And the river caught fire and they had to call the, I mean, good luck to a fire department trying to put out a fire when it's the river itself that's burning. So that caused such a hue and cry that I think it, that among other things precipitated better controls over the dumping of waste. But there you go, definitely. Uh, that was one situation where dumping waste into the water basically killed the river for a time. Uh, it may or may not have recovered. The Thames in London, similarly, you know, the Thames River flows through London, and the River Thames used to have salmon, and you got people writing about the salmon in the Thames and catching salmon in the Thames. And then the Thames became so polluted by industrialization that the salmon disappeared, and that became a kind of a benchmark for the state of the river that the river was so polluted that salmon wouldn't even swim in it. When they cleaned up the river, and they did over time, the salmon came back. So that was a kind of an undoing, a reversibility. But it, it gets on, uh, much bigger than that. The scale of pollution, you may know that the Great Lakes are the world's largest uh, bodies of fresh water. The five Great Lakes that straddle the U.S.-Canadian border are absolutely massive, huge, huge. Uh, the, the largest fresh water in the world uh, in terms of area. And some of them are so big that they're like oceans practically. You can have huge storms on them with giant waves and ships, a lot of ships have sunk in Lake Ontario because of that. But I mean, they're big, they're big bodies of water. They were so polluted in the 30s, 40s, 50s 
uh, and 60s by over industrialization and dumping just uh, irrespective of uh, again the exploitation of the resource everybody was just dumping into the lakes and they became biologically dead at least two of them and maybe more of them they were declared biologically dead at one point there was nothing living could even stay alive uh, they were so uh, polluted with waste uh, industrial waste mostly and they've been reversed too uh, interestingly enough, after environmental laws were put into place on both sides of the border, I think that the Great Lakes have also, to a certain extent, recovered biologically. So fortunately, that was reversed. But there you go, tragedy the commons with respect to dumping. So that's right, uh, Stuart. Also, uh, we have dumping of raw sewage into the oceans. Uh, many, many cities that are on the coasts find it much simpler um to just to dump their waste into the oceans thinking that the oceans are basically so vast that there are commons that can never be overexploited. that's not true uh, it turns out that the oceans are polluted with any number uh, now of of toxins that not only degrade the sea floor and therefore uh, as they sink to the ocean floor and and pollute the ocean floor they interfere with the food chain because they're going to destroy a layer of the ecosystem. And if you tamper, you know that, if you tamper with one layer of the ecosystem, then it has a, uh, a chain reaction effect on the other layers. You can end up destroying an entire ecosystem by eradicating uh, one layer of it, which is what's happened in some cases. And uh, the, the pollution spreads. It doesn't stay in one place. So there, the oceans are full of pollution. I remember even in the 70s, uh, I remember very distinctly in the 70s when I was traveling, um, walking on beaches all over the world, uh, not everywhere, I didn't go everywhere, but every beach I walked on, uh, certainly around the Mediterranean on both sides, I walked on beaches on the north side of the Mediterranean in different countries and on the south side and the North African side as well, and there was no beach that you could walk on in those days around the Mediterranean without picking up oil on the bottom of your feet. Uh, you wouldn't see oil necessarily in the water, and you wouldn't necessarily even see oil in the sand, but there were oil spills. And because the Mediterranean is a fairly enclosed sea, uh, they were not really dispersed. They eventually washed up on all of the shores. So you would, at the end of the day, after spending on the beach, see that your the bottom of your feet had collected little patches of oil which you could scrape off your skin. So it was clear that the oil had dispersed throughout the Mediterranean, which was another tragedy, the commons. Uh, let, me, let me now give you a more serious example because it comes from our use uh, and our disposal of single-use plastic. You know that there has been lately a big hue and cry about that. You're aware of this, right? In New York, we ban the use of, for the most part, the use of single-use plastic bags has been banned and people are being discouraged from uh, unnecessary single uses of all kinds of plastic. I'm sure you're all aware of this. Am I right? You must be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Are you aware of the size of the, of the garbage patches that are now uh, located, that have accumulated in the oceans, in the Atlantic and the Pacific, specific in particular? There are giant float, they call them patches. And that's really an understatement. These are patches of garbage. Most of it is plastic that's been dumped into the ocean or thrown into the ocean and has somehow agglomerated into these enormous islands. Literally, I would say small continents of plastic. It's not merely now that they're a little pat a patch doesn't sound very big. The biggest one in the Pacific is more than visible from space. It's called the Great Pacific Garb, the Great Plastic Garbage Patch. You can Google it. There's nothing great about it. It's terrible. It's made entirely of, of garbage, most of it floating plastic garbage, and it is 1.6 million square kilometers. You 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 have no idea how big this thing is. That is twice the size of of Texas, twice the size of the state of Texas or if you prefer three times the size of France. This is one gigantic floating patch of plastic garbage that has resulted in over -exploit from over-exploitation of the ocean. So again, what's the difference if one person throws a piece of plastic into the Pacific Ocean 
uh, no difference. It'll eventually biodegrade in 400 years or disappear or whatever. No one's going to really notice it. The odds of you noticing one piece of plastic are astronomically small. But if everybody in the earth, more or less indiscriminately, is either themselves throwing plastic in the water or getting rid of plastic, uh, uh, perhaps not, not realizing that the people who are collecting it are going to dump it in the water, then eventually you're going to end up with these enormous anomalies, man-made catastrophes, really, which affect wildlife. The plastic itself, as we know, uh, releases all kinds of microtoxins. As it degrades, it poisons fish, uh, not only kills them when they become tangled with it or try to eat it, um, as well as whales and other mammals uh, that are seagoing, but also pollutes the water with, with microtoxic particles. Uh, there's a technical name for them. And, and also pollutes beaches. Yeah, there's nowhere you can go anymore. I, I don't think there's a single beach in the world where you can go anymore and not wa walk into the water and step on plastic garbage. Um, whether, you know, there's just, it is unbelievable. Uh, there are no more pristine beaches. Maybe there are some private beaches where people pay an awful lot of money to have 100 yards of beach or whatever it is every day groomed and people wading into the water or jet skiing around the water and collecting garbage. But um, if you don't attend to it, uh, you will see trash being washed up from the ocean on every coastline in the world now, including what used to be what we as humans prized as obviously very beautiful beaches. We are being, uh, we come from aquatic backgrounds and we, people, most people love to be near water at certain times or at vacation times, but that that resource, a uh, beautiful resource, and also a naturally important resource, namely the oceans, have been uh, polluted, defaced, and and partly destroyed by this kind of over exploitation. So that's a tragedy of a commons uh, on the hugest possible scale. We're talking about seventy percent of this earth being uh, water, only thirty percent of it land. Yeah. So the oceans were thought to be so big that you could do what you wanted. But obviously that's not true. And we've unfortunately done a lot of damage to them. So that's another example of Hardin's case. Um, now, what about the creatures that live in the oceans? Uh, we, we almost eliminated all the whales in the world. Whaling used to be an enormous industry. Why were people whaling? Anybody know? Why people were whaling? I mean, there was a primary reason. One species at least was almost wiped out for one reason only. Shall I give you a hint? The sperm whale uh, was almost completely uh, made extinct because oh, it was being hunted for one thing. Got it. It's because the, the whale, can you hear me? I'm sorry? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Because the whale fat or blubber, it could be yeah, but the not the blubber. The blo it was the in the case of the sperm whale, it was the it was the, the sperm whale had oil, had a gland full of oil called spermaceti, and they used this for lamps. These are the days before electricity, when people were burning candles. Wax was obviously a source, but the whale oil was even better as as an oil as a uh, to be to be burning. And it had other uses too. So people were actually throwing out the whale. They were just taking the oil from the sperm whale but for the most part. Turn, sorry, can't you also turn blubber into oil? Yes, they were using blubber as well and melting, rendering the blubber. But the sperm whale had this particular substance in a gland called spermaceti, which was pure, more or less pure oil. And that was what was being harvested for the most profit. In any case... Uh, the, the thing is that whales were hunted almost to extinction, uh, and, and they still are being hunted illegally, as you probably know, or some cases countries, uh, some countries haven't signed off on the international treaties. I'm not up to speed on this. But we brought them back just in the nick of time uh, by banning large-scale whale hunting. But the same is not true of fishing. And uh, there are many, many parts of the world where fish used to be abundant, and I mean fishes, in English, fish is both seeing, it's English is irritating, isn't it? Fish means one fish or many fish. 
It's, a, it's both a singular and plural, right? One fish or a dozen fish. But that's only if you're talking about one species of fish. If you're talking about many species of fish, then the plural is fishes. All right, just so you may know or not know, I'm bringing it to your attention grammatically, that fish is singular and plural if you're talking about the same fish. But if you're talking about different species of fish, then you would say fishes. That would be the plural. So many fishes have been brought to the edge of extinction, or rather many areas in which fishes were plentiful have been fished out by exactly this problem, over over-exploitation. Canada, for an example, had a very, very beautiful, naturally prolific uh, fishing ground called the Grand Banks, I'll spell it Grand Banks, off the coast of Newfoundland. This used to be one of the world's great, great storehouses of cod and other, other fishes uh, that teemed there. And uh, the great fishing nations of the world, and I'm not saying this to name names, there are many, but the, the big fishing nations like Portugal and Norway and Japan and Russia and others who eat a lot of fish, and not only them, but other countries that's, that anyway market a lot of fish, they basically added more and more boats to their fleets. It was the same thing as adding more cows to your herd. And so they were fishing and overfishing. And they fished so much, and then they started with these drift nets, these huge nets, which would sweep up, I don't know how many thousand tons of fish at one time. So basically, they overfished uh, uh, the Grand Banks to the point where the, fish, the fishes could no longer sustain their populations. And they collapsed. They literally collapsed. Because Canada at the time only had a 12-mile international limit. Banks were well beyond. Yeah? So... When the Grand Banks collapsed for because of overfishing, then uh, Canada bravely declared a 200-mile limit around, but it was too late. There were no more fishes. The real tragedy was, the secondary tragedy was to the fishing, the fishing communities of Newfoundland itself. Newfoundland is, a, is a, not a wealthy province. They have no natural resources. Things don't grow well there. It's cold. It's very northerly and climate's not good, they don't have agriculture to speak of. They have fishing villages, that's where most of the income was being derived. And when the Grand Banks were fished out through over-exploitation on a huge international scale, the local fishermen couldn't even catch enough to sustain themselves. Just going out with a fishing boat, they couldn't sustain their own villages anymore. So the government of Canada, fairly recently, I'm talking about 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, started buying back the fishing licenses. So they were paying them what seemed like a big chunk of cash, maybe, I don't know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to buy back the fishing license. But once that money ran out, there was nothing else for them to do. And you couldn't get new commercial fishing licenses. So would that industry collapsed. And then these people, I imagine many of them are on welfare now because they spent that money and there's nothing for them to live on. So they basically reduced them to poverty by allowing for the over-exploitation of what was once a world-famous resource. The Grand Banks were famous, not only for the abundance, but also for the variety of fishes. So that was a clear tragedy the commons, and they moved on. Now, you know that the world's appetite for fish, including with the population of the world being, being ever-expanding, has resulted in the replacement of natural uh, overfishing with aquaculture. So this is one attempt to mitigate that problem, isn't it? We have more and more so-called fish farms. So fishes are being farmed, literally farmed. Popular fishes are being farmed to the extent that they can be. Uh, and that produces other problems, uh, the same kinds of problems you get with the intensive uh, farming of, of, of other animals like chickens, where they get overcrowding and they get diseases and they need to be given a lot of antibiotics, which people ingest with the meat. So you have over, over, over uh, crowding in these uh, uh, aquacultures and these fishes will get diseases that they don't get in the wild. Then they have to be given a lot of antibiotics and that changes the quality of the food itself and perhaps poses a kind of health hazard to humans too in the long run. So in any case, the over-exploitation of the world's uh, great fishing grounds is another example, is it not, of a tragedy of the commons. So we've looked at quite a few. Uh, we haven't talked about the dumping of raw sewage into the oceans, but that goes on to this day. 
There are still cities, many large cities, uh, maybe not so much in the developed world, but certainly in the developing world, no question that many large cities dump raw sewage uh, straight into the ocean. And undoubtedly, that, that's not a good thing. Um, I want to mention one more example to you. <laughs> that's space junk. Yeah, believe it or not, uh, we now have something like 34,000 pieces of space junk in orbit. There are only about 2,000 satellites that are being used at the moment and another 3,000 or so that are disused. We have dead satellites. It takes a long time for them to decay from, from high orbit. The orbits will decay eventually. They'll fall back to Earth. Most of them will be burned up in the atmosphere. Uh, but, but but more or less, uh, they're, they're, all, they're all these pieces of debris, dead satellites and pieces of space junk floating around out there. So uh, leave it to us, right? We've turned the, uh, you know, we've turned orbital space into a junkyard too. So I guess one day if you want to build your own satellite, you'll be able to go shopping in some space junkyard. You know, some, some entrepreneur will set up a low space junkyard. You'll be able to go up there and shop for you satellites. Uh, I guess I'm just joking with you, but uh, I guess, uh, I mean, humans seem to be very good at this, don't we? Uh, where it looks like, uh, oh, look, we can dump stuff out there, you know, launch something there. And when we're done with it, we'll just leave it there. You know, there's a lot of space in space. <laughs> but it turns out that we're pretty good at cluttering up our orbital space as well. That problem will only worsen as we uh, do more uh, space uh, exploration and launch more stuff up there. So again, how do you clean it up? It's really not very profitable and obviously very expensive to go up there and collect stuff. I have no idea how you could possibly clean that up. Easier to clean up the uh, the garbage in the oceans than to clean up the space junk that's floating around the earth. So uh, I, get, I guess you now understand how widespread and, and, and how diverse this problem really is. And maybe some of you can also think of other examples of it, but uh, I wanted to get your minds working about this uh, and now we're going to go to two more. We have two more scenarios to cover, which are also part of the same problem. They're not going to be on the same scale because you're not. This is going to be a, a case called free riding. Um, uh, or, but before we go there, I'll come back to the room and see if you have any comments or questions. Um, any comments or questions about what we've done so far with the, with the applications of this model? As you can see, it's an n-person prisoner's dilemma where most people defect, and that, and that's what produces tragedies of the commons. Is everybody with me on this? Ahmed, do you want to say something? Yes, I have a comment, Professor. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Thanks. Okay, so uh, what about the freedom to reproduce? Like, uh, people, a lot of people here in the United States don't have kids because kids are very expensive, but if for some reason an entire community was able to sustain the ability to have kids and everyone decided to have 10 kids, then isn't that a tragedy of the commons because the kids will use up these resources? <laughs> well, this is a great example that you've raised, Ahmed, a really very interesting example. It's also going to become very controversial because now we're talking about people themselves and what has always been deemed to be a natural right. Uh, except recently in China, you will know that although that has now been changed, that for a very long time, China was worried about this problem of overpopulation, especially in a large and populous country. You do not want to have, if you're the government, one problem you surely don't want to have is the problem of not being able to feed your own people, correct? Whether you're having to import food or whether you're growing enough food or a combination of both, the point is that you never want to be in a situation where you cannot feed your own people. That That is both uh, from a humane perspective undesirable and also from a political perspective, perspective very dangerous. If people don't have enough to eat, then obviously they may foment a revolution with some justification. So you don't want people to be hungry in your own country if you can possibly avoid it. Uh, China had this concern of being one of the two most populous nations on earth and not necessarily being in a position to be sure of being able to provide enough food, they decided very sensibly in a certain way to limit their population. And so they did. you remember the one-child policy? You're aware of it? 
It's the yep. two thousand. Yeah, I am aware of it. It's the two. All right. Now they've relaxed it. And by the way, it never applied to everybody. The one-child policy applied to the Han Chinese majority. About seventy percent of China is this one ethnicity called Han, and it was the Han Chinese who were restricted. The other fifty-five or so uh, ethnic minorities that they recognize uh, were not under that same rule because there weren't enough of them to cause a problem. They were allowed to have more children, but the main majority was not. And so they kept the population down now that they have industrialized enough and they have a whole bunch of other problems that emerge from one child psychology and one child families and a whole generation now of, of single children in which by, by the way, the males vastly outnumber the females because of gender preference and selectivity. Uh, that's another problem now. Uh, they have all kinds of new problems caused by that. But I can well take your point originally that if you just allow people to have as many babies as basically they want to have or can have uh, without any mindfulness about, about the economics of the situation, then indeed it could pose a huge problem. Sure, definitely could pose a problem uh, just in terms of feeding them all. Absolutely. So um, as the earth gets more and more populated, um, and we've never had so many people, uh, and as more and more people live in cities, in, in 2009, we crossed that Rubicon where for the first time in human history, more people live in cities than in the countryside. So th this potentially exacerbates the problem if you're living in a city where it's more expensive than having babies is even more expensive than it would be in the countryside, presumably. Uh, so that, that exacerbates the problem. It may also partially help explain why the Western world is actually depopulating itself uh, and for a very complicated constellation of reasons, um, Caucasian peoples definitely are depopulating themselves across Western civilization. Not everybody is, though. Other ethnic groups are certainly uh, not encumbered for any reason and are, are having five or ten children per family. Um, so it's quite an uneven phenomenon if you want to study it globally. Uh, but in a given country, certainly you would be, I think, correct to argue that population itself could pose a huge problem. It could also be an asset, uh, depending on demographics. India has the world's largest population now, I believe, bigger than China. And they also have uh, a huge number of young people. I think, uh, I don't know what it is, but it's some enormous fraction, uh, maybe half the people, if not more, are under 30. And this is pr becomes an economic resource. It becomes uh, also a challenge to employ them but also becomes an economic powerhouse potentially if a majority can be employed because their economy will grow. It has been growing and will continue to post-COVID, it will. So uh, population is a complicated problem. But there were more naive and more simplified concerns uh, that were addressed. And this brings up other specters which have nothing to do with the tragedy of the commons. But then if you go back a century and more, you'll hear people talking about uh, eugenics and and the potential misapplications of eugenics uh, because it's usually uh, and and he mentions this too Hardin does in his essay it's it's usually the case empirically that it's actually the people with the least resources who produce the most children you know the people who are socioeconomically the worst off are very often the ones historically who end up producing the most children and that poses a different kind of an issue I'm not just one, but many. So there are lots of moral, there are lots of moral problems that come from this, lots of moral questions and some very interesting ones. But I would agree with you that on, you know, in the most general possible way, um, if you just allow a given population to increase without bound, then it in itself could entail a tragedy of the commons just on having too many mouths to feed. And if that was your point, I, I certainly agree. Uh, but with humans uh, being the uh, resource at stake, it will call into question many very contentious uh, moral problems as well, right? So you're going to there get into controversial waters, which for a philosopher is okay, as long as you're aware of it beforehand. All right, good point. Anything else? So then let me let me go to the last two points I want to make with you today. So we have about 15 minutes left. And uh, the two, these are two more scenarios uh, which stem from the tragedy of the commons. Uh, and uh, they're a little less extreme. This is where you're going to have not necessarily a majority, 
but maybe a, a smaller number of people who decide to cheat the system one way or another. So we're going to look at it systemically now. We're looking at societies and, and systemic properties of societies. And in any society, arguably, uh, you're, you're going to have um, a certain percentage of people who try and work the system. We have a lot of uh, phrases for this in English, working the system, gaming the system, cheating the system. And I suppose uh, we have so many different ways of saying that because it's being done in so many different ways. I have no doubt. There are always possible. There are always people around uh, who are going to, one way or another, try and cheat the system. But then it becomes an in-person prisoner's dilemma, not necessarily a tragedy of the commons. But let me ask you this. Imagine, let's take some concrete examples of how would you cheat the system. Uh, let's look at New York City when it was normal, when, when you had millions of people riding the subway every day. Uh, the subway manages to run at a loss anyway, doesn't it? Even if everybody pays, they somehow lose money. Uh, but you know, because you've all ridden the subway, I assume you've all seen people fare dodging. Am I right? You've all seen people doing that? Uh, yes. And right, of course. By fare dodging, I mean either leaping over the turnstile or, or doing a limbo under the turnstile or walking through the open door when, you know, when someone goes through with a baby carriage and someone else dashes through behind them without paying. And, you know, people are basically, we call it fare dodging. Uh, exactly. they're, they're, they're cheating the system. They're free riding, right? They're it's actually much easier than that because a lot of buses, they operate using the honor system, the SBS buses. So you don't even have to pay. You just got to really? Yeah. I find that extraordinary. Now, there are some countries where the honor system still works. I've been in Germany and I've ridden the metro or, you know, in a number of cities. I remember my first time doing it in Frankfurt. I walked down there and there was no turnstile. There's just you walk into the subway and there's a machine and you buy your ticket and, and, and there's nothing there, which prevents you from just walking onto a subway and getting off where you want and not using a ticket at all. I guess there are random checks, but it's the honor system and people actually buy the tickets for the most part. They don't lose that much money. Uh, there are other countries where, this, where they would never let this happen because everybody would cheat. So in any case, all I'm saying to you is the following, that if a very few people cheat the system, then, okay, the system has to absorb the cost of that. That is costly. And the cost gets passed on to whom? Who ends up paying for the cheaters? The taxpayer. Yeah, the user. I mean, the reason, one of the reasons why subway fares go up all the time is partly because in our, our system is completely, I gather, corrupt and incompetent. Uh, plus old, it costs a lot to maintain 24-7. I mean, it's, a lot of factors go into it. But at the end of the day, rest assured that the taxpayers will, will be given the burden, uh, whether you use the system or not, and particularly if you do, uh, the burden will fall on you. So a few people profit by defecting, right? In this case, defection means I'm cheating the system. I'm getting something for nothing. Literally, I'm free riding. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. And if you're free riding, you rest assured someone else is having to pay for that cost. So let me ask this next question. What would happen if everybody, or if like 90% of the people cheated the system? What would happen to the New York subway? I don't know how many people cheat the system. Let's say, I don't know, let's say 5%, maybe not that many, but let's say 5%. So 95% pay. What if it were the other way around? What if 95% of the people cheated the system? What would happen to the system? If 95% of users on the New York subway stopped paying and cheated the system, what would happen? We, we would have no system to begin with because the MTA would not afford to, or even if they could afford to, they still wouldn't pay the... No, uh, you're, the you stop there. You're, you quit while you're ahead. You're right. It would collapse. The system would collapse. It needs cash flow. The system needs a certain amount of income in order to maintain itself, notwithstanding the debt. But the system itself would collapse. If you shut off the cash flow, they go out of business just like anybody else. Uh, you know, at some point, they just, they just say, we can't afford to operate. We can't afford to pay our workers. We can't afford the electricity, whatever it is. So they would be out of business. 
And then you would have a tragedy of the commons. You see where everybody cheating would bring the system down. That would be a real tragedy of the commons. If you have a small number of people cheating, it's not a tragedy of the commons, but it's a free riding scenario where the people who are cheating the system may be getting away with it, but they're also obliging the honest, so-called honest people who are not cheating the system to actually pay a bigger price for their honesty. You get it? Can anybody think of any other systemic problems that are analogous to this? Free riding, so-called free riding? There are many if you start thinking about what people do. I'm sure you'll come up with other examples. I could think of one that's actually at mine. Like, I, I don't know. Can you hear me first? Yep, I can hear you. What's your example? Uh, so, for example, say I have an internet connection. This happens really frequently. And I give my internet connection to three or four neighbors. And I tell them, use it for the day and then turn it off. If you have four people, two people will use it for the day and then turn it off. But the other two people will keep using it. And that's going to take away from my uh, from my internet and from the people that use internet under me. And then everyone's going to be forced to pay more. Maybe. But, I'm not so sure about how that actually works with shared connections. Uh, but I can think of a more obvious example, and that would be cheating on income tax. Mm-hmm. Because if you cheat, I mean, the government needs a certain amount of money to operate and they depend on tax to get it. And if people cheat on their income tax, then they're going to end up raising taxes and the people who pay tax are going to end up paying more in theory. If people cheat, they, they, that debt will be passed on to others. The tax burden will be shared, therefore, by others who pay their taxes. Uh, you can think about welfare fraud. You can think about there are all kinds of frauds that go on in our system. Uh, uh, and uh, welfare fraud being one, people who work but are getting paid cash under the table and are still collecting welfare. For example, um, I don't begrudge people money. I mean, it's expensive to live in this country and, and you can never have enough, it seems. But, you know, there are people who try and game the system one way or another. And so people who perpetrate fraud of one kind or another are inevitably doing what we call free riding so other people are, are going to end up paying more. There's also this thing that happens in restaurants uh, when there used to be restaurants. Uh, I forget the name for it, where people eat a meal where they could just run out of the restaurant without paying, right? Or sometimes they fake being sick. And in the confusion, they call an ambulance and then they disappear in an extreme case. Or they their friends say, oh, I'll take them to the hospital. And they all run out of there without paying. There's all kinds of scams where people would eat an expensive meal and then manage to escape from the restaurant on a seemingly valid pretext, but not pay. Yeah, so there's this diner's fraud that goes on. So who ends up holding the bag? The restaurant has just had to give away the food to supposedly a paying customer, and they have to, therefore, uh, probably at the end of the day, either just eat the loss or raise the prices on their menu to pass the losses on to the consumer. Certainly, shoplifting qualifies as a big example of that. I'm sure that every retail industry, every kind of retail store, again, in normal economic times, not COVID times, but in normal economic times when tons of people are shopping, you get always a certain amount of shoplifting. So think about the expense that uh, merchants have to incur in order to try to prevent or deter shoplifting. You have security cameras, which means people have to be watching them. You have, especially in casinos where people cheat if they can at the gaming tables, everybody's being watched in a casino, right? But in a normal store, you have security guards, you have systems on clothes with stuff that's affixed to them that gets removed at the cash. You've got on top of that security cameras. You have all these precautions, which merchants take in order to prevent theft of their merchandise, right? And that's costly. You, you know that doesn't come free, that they have to pay security guards. They have to pay for this extra stuff to put on and take off clothing. They have to pay for uh, cameras and for people to watch the tapes. So it costs them money to protect their uh, wares and their goods against uh, shoplifters. But even so, there's shoplifting that happens. And uh, then at the end of the day, the people who cheat the system by shoplifting are going to raise the prices. And once again, 
the extra costs will have to be sooner or later passed on to the consumer. So the people who are honest are the ones who end up paying the price for the people who are dishonest. And that is, again, called free riding. Uh, it's not the same as a tragedy of the commons because we're dealing here with only a, usually a minority of people, but they're still causing potentially significant damage by their so-called free riding, which is a metaphor for all these ways of cheating. Is this clear? Yes. This actually happened at the restaurant that I worked in. The customers yep. would steal the Tupperware because their Tupperware is silver and gold. That's <laughs> real silver. So people yeah. would steal it before they, after they pay. They just put it into their bag or like go to the bathroom and never come back. And we would have Amazing. to raise the price by like 2 or $3 because the silverware is expensive. It costs like $200. For of like course. $10. Amazing. So they're not only they're not only trying to eat free; they're actually stealing the cutlery out of the restaurant. So there you go. That'll that'll teach you to have nice cutlery, won't it? But if you gave people plastic, then they probably wouldn't steal it. But then, of course, you're you couldn't charge as much because you'd lose a certain amount of prestige if you're a restaurant serving with plastic Thanks, cutlery. Yeah. It's no longer real silver. Right. Right. Okay. Well, that's also free riding, you know, to an extreme of a certain kind. Uh, so you appreciate this. The difference is, what's the difference? If you walk into a store and you see a few people shoplifting, you may even see people in a grocery store, you might sometimes, or a convenience store, you might see people pocketing a candy bar. Uh, in grocery stores, people have come up with all kinds of ways to shoplift, you know, hiding, walking with overcoats in the winter and stuffing food into their pockets. And you, you can sometimes see that happen. Um, and uh, uh, if it's happening on a small scale, we call it shoplifting. What if you walk into a store and everybody's taking stuff? What's that called? If you walk into a store and you just decided to go shopping in this store and suddenly you see everybody, you know, just ch ch taking stuff and charging out of the store without paying, what's it called? That's looting. That's looting. Every time, yeah, that's looting, and then that's that's a tragedy to the commons. That's when everyone's trying to take stuff, yeah. Then it degenerates. It ends up destroying the store. I mean, the store owner is going to have to, if if he's covered by insurance, and insurance will pay for it, but then the rates will go up. The store is going to be unusable. Nobody can use that store when it's looted. It has to be restocked, rebuilt, uh, refurbished, and all of that. So that becomes a tragedy. Looting is definitely. A tragedy of the commons, where the commons in this case is a, a store. Uh, but if a few people are doing it, it's going to be free riding, but it will still push the costs up for everybody. And so it's a prisoner's dilemma. Moral of the story it's a prisoner's dilemma with many players in which a certain number of people will be defecting, and that will inevitably cause problems. The definitive publication on that, I put the reference up there. It's by a philosopher named Philip Pettit, 1986, Free Riding and Foul Dealing. Uh, it's a fairly advanced publication, but you, he, he's the one who coined the term, and that is, is basically the context. It's an end-person prisoner's dilemma. So I hope you see from this today that the uh, prisoner's dilemma is actually a richer model than just the two-player game. When we get to the end-player game, it has a lot of different manifestations and a lot of applications to our contemporary way of life, actually, in a great many domains. Uh, so it's a rich model, is it not? Very rich. Not always a very happy model. Depends on, on how many people defect and what the costs of mass defection are. But it's a, a very applicable model, is it not? I guess you can see that. Uh, so we are basically done with the prisoner's dilemma. We have a minute or so left today. Uh, so I just want to mention to you before we wrap up that uh, I was glad to see some of you in the room. Uh, it's always nicer to be inter interacting with people. But again, most are taking uh, well-deserved Thanksgiving, and I hope you will now, too. I hope the remainder of your day will be devoted to some leisure, hopefully, and all of that. But we've introduced this model for more than this week's purpose. Next week is our last week of classes, although it's not our last Monday. Uh, the last Monday, I will do a general review of this section. 
But next week on Monday, we'll be looking at a very interesting and quite counterintuitive kind of prisoner's dilemma. It's a really special case called Newcomb's Problem, and it involves a predictor and your, your chance to, uh, in a hypothetical scenario, to get a lot of money if you make the right choice. Uh, but uh, it involves a predictor problem, which throws a new kind of complication into the works. And you can either look ahead at that or simply enjoy your weekend. And I'll look forward to seeing you back in the plenary next Monday. Okay, fair enough. Uh, okay. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, uh, Stuart asked. You're more than welcome. Thank you for coming out today. No extra credit, but I really appreciate your spirit of inquiry and your hunger or your thirst for philosophy to come out on a holiday like this. Uh, uh, that shows, uh, uh, so, well, I think Aristotle would be impressed with the virtue. Uh, Stuart asks, what is the reading, reading for next week? Uh, it continues. It's called, I'll put it into the uh, in into your actual, uh, let me just type it in. It's called Newcomb's Problem, Stuart. Newcomb's. Newcomb's Problem, and you can find a lot online uh, about Newcomb's Problem. Uh, there's no one reading, although the, the person who first published it is a, a philosopher called Robert Nozick. Uh, who, who who died some, a few years ago, was a really interesting philosopher at Harvard. And he's the first one in 1969 who published it um, in a collection. But you can probably find this online. And the actual model is included in the slides on the prisoner's dilemma. The last few slides are exactly illustrating Newcomb's problem. So you don't have to go any further than the slides in your Google Drive folder if you want to read Nozick's paper. I'm not sure if I uploaded it or not, but you can find it online and you can read about the problem there. All right. But the problem is called Newcomb's problem. But just be mindful, it's not different from a prisoner's dilemma. It has exactly the same structure as a prisoner's dilemma, but it, it, it's a very special kind of variation on that theme. And we'll be tackling that first thing Monday morning, and you'll all get a chance to uh, to see uh, how you would play this game. All right, so uh, once again, I'm wishing you all uh, a very happy Thanksgiving and a good weekend, and I'll see you Monday. Bye for now.